Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's Chemistry Webcast. In this webcast, we're going to be talking about some of the work done by J.J. Thompson, who is one of the leading physicists of the early 20th century, and the experiments he did that led to a new atomic model. So the story kind of starts around 1870 or so, when these devices known as Crookes tubes came to be very popular. They had some really interesting properties, and people were very interested in them. So if we talk about Crookes tubes in a little more detail, all right, so what we have are two metal plates in a sealed glass tube, and then it's pretty much a vacuum inside the glass tube. And if you apply an electric current to the metal plates, one of the metal plates, called the cathode, will emit this glowing ray that travels to the other piece of metal, which is called the anode. All right, you have to have the current on for you to see this, and the fluorescent coating behind the tube makes it possible to see the ray. These were really interesting things. They had some interesting phenomena, and I'd like to talk about those. Um, they're sometimes also called cathode ray tubes, and for a long time they were used to make TVs and computer monitors, and although they're kind of out of date now, they're very stable technology and really very useful. All right, so let's go on and talk about these. The nature of the cathode rays became a really hot topic in physics. What is going on with these? They had some, like I said, interesting properties. They cast a shadow. They can turn a paddle wheel. You can actually make the paddle wheel spin. All right, and even more interesting, if you had a magnetic field, the cathode ray would bend in the presence of, of a magnetic field. We'd say they're deflected, that's the technical term. These were really interesting behaviors. What's going on with these? So, J.J. Thompson decided to investigate them in a lot more detail. J.J. Thompson was an English physicist who studied at Cambridge. He went there on scholarship and eventually won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1906. He was exceptionally gifted at designing apparatus and equipment for new experiments, and he really got interested in this, and he just went to town. So, the other thing that's worth noting is that seven of his students themselves went on to win Nobel Prizes. This was quite the lab, let me tell you. Um, so in 1897, he turned his attention to the Crookes tubes, all right, and the behavior of the cathode rays, specifically in the presence of an electric field. Now, we know from Maxwell's equations that electric fields and magnetic fields are related, so you know, it seemed like a very logical thing to do. And he wanted to see what would happen to the cathode ray when electric fields were present. And these really elaborate setups, right? So I've got actually a very simplified diagram here compared to everything that Thompson did in 1897. And what he found is that when the, the um, electric field was applied and you had the cathode ray, it would bend, it would deflect towards the positive end of the field, which suggests that the cathode rays are negatively charged. Hmm. They're negatively charged. They can make a paddle wheel spin, which implies they can transfer momentum. These are really interesting things, these cathode rays. And J.J. Thompson had a eureka moment, all right, and said, I think I know what these are. The other thing he did, and I'm not showing the apparatus for this, is he measured the mass to charge ratio of the cathode rays. These were very detailed technical experiments. To get a mass to charge ratio, he's implying these have a mass and they're negatively charged. Have you figured it out? What did Thompson discover, right? He said cathode rays are made of tiny negatively charged particles, and eventually they settled on the term electrons for these tiny negatively charged particles. He just discovered the electron. Ooh, so moving forward from what Dalton had said, atoms are indivisible. We have subatomic particles. All right, he then decided, wait a minute, all atoms must contain electrons. I can build cathode ray tubes with almost any metal. They can all do this. It must be a universal property, all right? And we also know that atoms are electrically neutral. So if atoms contain electrons, there must be something positive inside of them. And that led to the first model of atomic structure. And then we'll go on to that in a second. Okay. So here's Thompson's model of the atom. He proposed that the electrons were embedded in a sphere of diffuse gel-like positive charge. I always think of jello when I think of this model. And it was called the plum pudding model. That's a popular British dessert. We around here don't eat plum pudding all that often. You might think of it as fruit in jello. It might be a more uh, familiar term. 
right? So we have a sphere of positively charged where the positive charge is sort of spread out throughout the entire sample. And then we have these little tiny electrons just sort of floating around in them in some way, right? So this is the plum pudding model. In summary, Thompson studied the behavior of cathode rays. You need to know that. You need to know that the results of these experiments show that all elements, all atoms contain electrons. All right, and then he proposed the plum pudding model of the atom, saying that the tiny electrons are embedded in a sphere of positive charge. And that's where we are. It's, you know, 1898, and that's the model of the atom that we have. What's going to happen next? We have to test the model. That's the point of another webcast. I'll talk to you later.